So I'm here with um, Chief Najawan, Chief of the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation, Kathleen Ryan, who is the energy resource person for the San Saguenay Jube Nation's Environment Office, and Ryan Lazon, who is the fisheries biologist for Nawash. And we're going to be talking about um, uh, the fisheries and the state of the fishery in Georgian Bay and Lake Huron and asking people uh, what is going on in the fisheries. But first of all, <clears throat> Chief Najwan, maybe you could tell me how the heck you got commercial fishing rights to this whole area from Nottawasaga River all the way around to Goderich. You mean after the uh, inherent rate of uh, being the indigenous people of the territory, uh, that right was with the land and the water. And it's been a practice as a uh, former chief, uh, Ralph used to say from time immemorial and holds true to November of 1918, 2018, I mean. 2018. Yes. Now there was a court, uh, a court decision a number of years ago. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, the Fairgraves, uh, Jones and Edgewon, Fairgrave's decision just uh, was an avenue we had to take to, uh, I guess, prove to the Crown that these rights hadn't been abolished. They were still uh, in existence, and it was the, the route we took to finally put the rest that we do have inherent right to the fishery. Okay, and uh, that what did that do to the MNR's regime in this area, fishing regime, man management regime? Well, the ministry, uh, I guess through the court case, had to come to the uh, understanding that we, as having the inherent right to the fishery, we're going to be part and parcel mm -hmm. of any management system in the ter territorial waters Okay, so what is what is your concerns? I'm going to ask Kathleen, um, the resource manager or the um, energy manager for the Sun Environment Office. What are your concerns now about the fishery around the traditional territories? Well, I'm going to say that I Ryan should speak to the actual fishery. I think my background is more aquatic ecology so that's more the ecosystem of the lake so my concern is really around the current state of the ecosystem of the lake and the health uh, of fish and other aquatic organism populations in the lake um, i think we're at a very fragile moment right now where the a lot of uh, food sources for fish like lake whitefish are disappearing if not already disappeared um, and just the the entire ecosystem is really in a state of, of flux and uncertainty and then of course we have sort of ongoing alterations to shorelines and different inputs into the lake that that cause those changes even more and then of course the slow progression of climate change which will cause even more changes as well as existing invasive species that continue to change the environment but then also the prospect of new or more dominant invasive species like Asian carp becoming prevalent in the system. Okay well um, maybe then Ryan you could tell us a little bit about what you and your fishermen are seeing or Nawash fishermen are seeing today in the waters and how that's changed. Yeah, so we're actually seeing uh, many changes, even in just the last couple of years, th things have changed greatly in, in, in the waters of Lake Huron and in Georgia Bay. Uh, we're seeing uh, fish species in greater numbers uh, in some cases that, that we've never seen. For example, uh, the walleye fishery and the perch fishery uh, there's a number of reasons why that might be happening and um, you can uh, explain some of it with changes in, for example, alewife, which were an invasive species that uh, were feeding on the uh, walleye or pickerel eggs. Uh, those are now uh, no longer in the lake in any numbers. Uh, and then we're also seeing, uh, which is very disturbing, and, and that's uh, 
a, a great decline in the number of uh, lake whitefish, which is the principal fish for the fishery. And, uh, and it's very unfortunate uh, because the fishermen rely on that for their, their income. And that can be attributed to a lot of the changes that are going on in, in the lake. Uh, for example, um, invasive species for one. We have what are called the dracenid mussels, like the zebra and quagga mussels, which are actually uh, playing a huge impact in the lake because they're, they're actually taking a lot of those uh, nutrients, that, uh, like the zooplankton and the phytoplankton and that, and filtering those out of the water and those small white fish rely upon those uh, to feed and you know essentially we're taking out that that part of the food chain so those small white fish don't have any chance um, and, and that's not the only factor that's affecting them we also have uh, uh, a wide scale uh, what the ministry of natural resources calls their lake trout rehabilitation program uh, where there's uh, many, many uh, lake trout being stocked each year. Uh, and we are concerned uh, that uh, many of these stocked fish are uh, impacting the whitefish. They're, we're seeing cases where places that historically were dominated by whitefish are now dominated by lake trout, in particular in Georgia Bay. And I know speaking to the fishermen, many of them believe that the whitefish or the lake trout are actually uh, out competing the, the whitefish and, and driving them from areas where they used to be. Um, so let me interrupt. What, what are the whitefish eating then? Well, the older, older whitefish have somewhat adapted to a diet of those very mussels that are actually sucking all the that particular part of the food chain at the bottom. So they are feeding on those mussels, but they don't have the same uh, nutritional content uh, that their diet they used to have, which are small shrimp-like organisms and that, that used to be there and they're no longer present, which is means that uh, many of the whitefish don't have the, the same uh, condition that they used to because of that uh, poorer diet. And as far as the, the small white fish, when they, when they hatch out, essentially there's very, very little food for them. In a large case, they're just dying. Mm. At least that's the theory at the, at the present time. Um, so as I understand it, the zebra mussels will often soak up the, the contaminants at the bottom of the lake. Is that a worry? If the, if the white fish are, are actually eating them? Uh, it, it should be something to be concerned about because you are correct and, uh, and mussels uh, do something called bioaccumulation where they're, they're concentrating those toxins inside of them. So there may be some concern of, about that, but uh, um, we do have a program that uh, Environment Canada has out there and they actually monitor uh, species like whitefish for contaminants and so far and set uh, safe limits for consumption. So at this point in time, there is, we haven't seen anything saying you shouldn't eat whitefish or anything like that, but it's certainly something we should be uh, uh, mindful of and keeping an eye on. But uh, actually, it's interesting because zebra and quagga mussels uh, have kind of a multi-layered uh, impact on the fishery. It's not only that those mussels are impacting uh, the ability of the small whitefish to survive, but those same mussels are um, clarifying the lake. Uh, and that allows sunlight to penetrate further into the water column than ever before. And there's uh, some very uh, big issues now with algae because now the sunlight is able to penetrate very deep into the water column and grow this algae on the bottom. And at the same time, those mussels, when they're feeding, their uh, waste matter is being deposited on the bottom of the lake. So the algae are not only getting increased amounts of sunlight deeper into the water column, but they're also able to feed upon the waste that's being left by the mussels at the bottom of the lake. 
all that algae has many problems for the fishery, including uh, the fishermen getting, anytime there's any bit of a wind or anything, that algae starts rolling up and getting co covering the, the gill nets and, uh, and, and creating havoc in, the, in their, uh, their expensive things to replace. So hmm. it's a big impact, that, that algae. And we don't even know what kind of impact is that algae covering the shoals and affecting spawning for fish. There's a lot of big issues that we still need to understand more about. Kathleen, you had mentioned that there's um, a shoreline monitoring program or project in the works. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So that's a program that right now we're calling the Coastal Waters Monitoring Program. And the pilot project is supposed to launch in, we're planning for it to launch in the spring of 2019. And that program is something that we're working towards with Bruce Power. Um, this came about from the CNSC, from the Bruce License Renewal. Uh, this spring, and part of Bruce Power's commitments to to the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation to help address some of the ongoing concerns that we have was to invest in SON to collect our own uh, our own information, not only in the vicinity of the Bruce Power site, but uh, all the the waters of the territory. Um, so the main concerns that we've had regarding the Bruce uh, Power operations has been impingement and entrainment, which is just the sucking in of adult and larval fish eggs um, and then the thermal discharge which is that cooling water that gets sucked in when it gets pumped out at a warmer temperature and creates an artificial environment and can have uh, adverse effects to fish not only um, not necessarily death to fish but other impacts um, because fish are most sensitive to temperature and sort of organize themselves based on temperature. So that program is really going to look at the near shore areas uh, around the territory, near shore fish community. Um, so it'll measure sort of near shore fish community health, um, water quality, coastal wetland habitat. Um, and then we'll also have an ecological and cultural uh, knowledge component and that's directly where people from the San communities will contribute to our understanding of um, the past state of the, those environments and also the changes that have occurred over time uh, because just collecting scientific information we can't we can't get that depth of information from that we really just want to create a baseline for for all of the territory so we have something to measure against so we we're more aware of what's going on um, I mean, unfortunately, it won't look at uh, fish species like adult whitefish um, because they're in, in the deep, colder waters, except for when they're spawning. But it, we will work towards, uh, in a few years, looking at sampling larval fish in the vicinity of the Bruce site and otherwise to, to look at some of the things Ryan was talking about. Like, if whitefish are hatching, then why aren't they surviving? But just to see where there's more or less whitefish. So there might be areas, spawning shoals we could investigate too, to see the condition of them and see if that has any effect on survivorship. So what's the, uh, the boundaries of the shoreline? Are you, are you doing it for the whole traditional territory, right so from Goddard's to... It's uh, the boundaries for the program, for now anyway, for the first three years, because mm -hmm. we have to keep it manageable, will be from Inver Huron, so just below the Bruce site, uh, all the way around the, um, the peninsula, and all the way down to Owen Sound Harbor. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Chief, there's a land claim coming up, I understand. Um, what's the news on that? Do you, when is it going to hit the courts? And um, can you tell me a little bit about the impact it might have on the fishery? Well, I can tell you when it's uh, proposed to go to court, but I'm not willing to share any, any more prior to it being in court. How it could uh, uh, the, pertain to the fishery is that we do have a pending litigation on the uh, on the bottoms of the uh, lakes and in the including Georgian Bay uh, within our territory um, which would be the fishing territory so uh, we're gonna have to uh, to wait and see hmm. okay 
Well, I, I think that's enough. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Chief Najwin, for coming on to uh, the SON Environment Office uh, show and talking about the fisheries. And the same with uh, Kathleen Ryan, who is the energy uh, manager for for the two First Nations, Nawash and Sagin, and Ryan Lazon, who is the um, fisheries biologist for the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation.